Well, hello, hello. Happy holidays to everybody in DeBerry. Hi, Dad. <laughs> I'm Forrest Respice's daughter, Laura Salveson. And I'm Craig Johnson. And we're coming to you from our Minneapolis homes to send a little holiday cheer. We've got about 20 some minutes of stories and poems of the season. We'll start with a short bit from the most famous Christmas story ever written. Well, maybe the second most famous, <laughs> Craig. Molly was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event. A Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business call Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheeks, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, Oh, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. And if ever anyone dared to wish him a Merry Christmas, Scrooge would fix the poor unfortunate with an icy glare. Christmas? Bah! Humbug! Oh, oh dear. Maybe we need something a little more heartwarming? How about a Christmas letter from a very nice little girl. <laughs> to the New York Sun newspaper, September 21st, 1897. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Pap says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Will you tell me the truth? Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street, New York City. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. Not to believe in Santa Claus. You might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that no children or men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not but that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that there are, unseen or unseeable in the world. No Santa Claus. Thank goodness he lives and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, 10 times 10,000 years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Well, now we move from prose to poetry, 
with two pieces explaining how to get Christmas presents. So listen up. I'll do one by Eugene Field about a very naughty boy. But first, here's a familiar favorite by Clement Moore. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for our long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes did appear, but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment he must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle up to the sky. So up to the housetop, the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof as I drew in my head and was turning around. Down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry, his droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow, the stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. <laughs> he had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. <laughs> I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all! And to all, a good night. Father calls me William. Sister calls me Will. Mother calls me Willie. But the fellers call me Bill. Mighty glad I ain't a girl. Rather be a boy. Without them sashes, curls, and things that's worn by Fauntleroy. Love to chuck green apples and go swimming in the lake. Hate to take the castor oil they give for belly ache. Most all the time, the whole year round, there ain't no flies on me. But just for Christmas, I'm as good as I can be. Got a yeller dog named Sport. Sick him on the cat. First thing she knows, she doesn't know where she is at. Got a clipper sled. And when us kids go out to slide, long comes the grocery cart. And we all hook a ride. Grandma says she hopes that when I get to be a man, I'll be a missioner like her oldest brother, Dan. But Buffalo Bill and Cowboys is good enough for me, except just for Christmas when I'm as good as I can be. And then old sport, he hangs around so solemn-like and still, his eyes, they seem a saying, what's the matter, little Bill? The old cat sneaks off her perch and wonders what's become of them two enemies of hern that used to make things hum. But I am so polite and tend so earnestly to biz that mother says to father, how improved our Willie is. 
But father, having been a boy, well, he suspicions me when just for Christmas I'm as good as I can be. For Christmas, with its lots and lots of candies, cakes, and toys, was made, they say, for proper kids and not for naughty boys. So wash your face and brush your hair and mind your P's and Q's and don't bust out your pantaloons and don't wear out your shoes. Say yes, sir, to the ladies and yes, sir, to the men. And when there's company, don't pass your plate for pie again, but thinking of the things you'd like to see under that tree, then just for Christmas, be as good as you can be. <laughs> Emily Dickinson was a little less verbose than our previous writers. Before the ice is in its pools, before the skaters go, or any check at nightfall is tarnished by the snow, before the fields are finished, before the Christmas tree, wonder upon wonder will arrive to me. Well, back to prose. For one of the most beloved Christmas stories of all time, O. Henry's The Gift of the Magi. Oh, one dollar and 87 cents. That was all. And 60 cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one or two at a time, bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and 87 cents. And tomorrow would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it. <laughs> While the mistress of the house is gradually subsiding from sobs to sniffles, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electric bell from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to $20, the letters of Dillingham looked blurred as though they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with a powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas day and she had only a dollar 87 with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months. With this result, $20 a week doesn't go far. Expenses have been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only a dollar 87 to buy a present for Jim, her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. Suddenly, she whirled from the window and stood before the looking glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within 20 seconds. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window someday to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up quickly and nervously. Uh, once she faltered a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the streets into the street. 
Where she stopped, the sign said, Madame Sophroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly. Hardly looked the Sophroni. Will you buy my hair? I buy hair. Take off your hat and let's have a sight at the look of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. <sighs> Twenty dollars. Give it to me quick. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Ah, forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the other stores and she had turned them all upside down. It was a platinum watch chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. <laughs> as soon as she saw it, she knew it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. $21 they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the 87 cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out the curling iron and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love. Which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with tiny close-lined curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror, long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl, but what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the watch chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door, which he always entered. Then she heard his step away down on the first flight and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying little silent prayers about the simplest everyday things. And now she whispered, please God, make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in. He was thin and very serious. Poor fellow. He was only 22 and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat and had no gloves. Jim stepped inside the door as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed on Della and there was an expression in them that she could not read. And it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. <laughs> Uh, Jim, darling, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold it because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, oh, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? cut it off and sold it. Don't you like me just as well anyhow? I'm me without my hair, aren't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone? Uh, you needn't look for it. It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone too. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me for it went for you. Maybe the hairs on my head were numbered, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. <clears throat> For 10 seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. 
Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and laid it upon the table. Don't make any mistake about me, Dell. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut that could make me love my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick change to hysterical tears and wails. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back. That Della had worshipped for long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims. Just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the, the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, my hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leapt up like a little singed cat and cried, oh! Oh, Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. And give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Del, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them for a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men wonderfully wise men. Who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here we have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest. Everywhere, they are the wisest. They are the magi. Well, we began with Ebenezer Scrooge, so it seems fitting to end with him. Here's the closing page of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. But Scrooge was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the last thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello? What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer, and therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Oh, Bob trembled. 
he had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help in a straitjacket. A Merry Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened in this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. Scrooge had no further intercourse with the spirits, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us, of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> yes. Merry Christmas to everybody at DeBerry. Merry yes, Christmas, Dad. And a very happy new year. Bye-bye. Thanks so Bye. much.